So 1,500, huh? That's crazy. So the church hasn't uh, donated anything yet, but we were, I've already told her that the church is going to. But we've talked about 500, and so that's 2,000. So that's crazy. It's pretty good. So Merry Christmas. I am cold in here. I don't know if you guys are cold, but no, you got your no sweater on. I know, I'm getting old, man. I'm getting cold. I start running around in here. <laughs> um, Mary, did you know? Charlie ruined that song for me like three weeks ago. We're both, I mean, we, me, me and Charlie both have like a presence online. I mean, we, I feel like we're both pretty well connected in. But a few weeks ago, I was studying the, the Christmas story because we just started the book of Matthew. So if you're, if you're wanting to get ready, we're going to be in the book of Matthew this morning. But Charlie uh, came into the, my office and he's like, you know, online people are talking about that song. Like people are uh, kind of making fun of it because Mary did know. Because Gabriel, Gabriel showed up and told Mary exactly who Jesus was going to be. He's going to be the Savior. He's going to save mankind from their sins. And, and so, he, so he was just bringing that up to me and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so Mary did know, but it's a good song. And I also remember that song because a few, like five or six years ago, this older gentleman that just showed up on the basketball court out of nowhere when me and Graydon, youth pastor, were shooting hoops, he uh, started singing that song to me. And I'll never forget that. That was an interesting time. <laughs> he had a good voice. We thought he was an angel until we realized he was drunk. Uh, that was... <laughs> Such a long story. <laughs> I mean, he literally showed up out of nowhere, and he's like, pass me the ball. And we're like, who's this guy? So we gave him the ball, and he shot it and made it. He's like, give it back to me. Gave it back to him, shot a three-pointer, he made it. And then in my head, I was like, in Hebrews it says, sometimes you entertain angels unaware. And so then I pass him the ball, and he's like, I know what you're thinking. He's like, you think uh, sometimes you entertain angels unaware. And I was like, what? Shoots it, makes it again. He, he drops down on the ground, starts doing push-ups, starts clapping and stuff. <laughs> Me and Graydon were tripping out. But then we found out he was drunk, and he called his wife, and he put his wife on the phone, and it was interesting. So, yeah. 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 It was Dustin's birthday last week on Thursday. It was Noah's birthday on Friday. They have back-to-back birthdays. And we celebrate Jesus' birth this week. More important. No offense to those guys. So let's pray again and continue on in Matthew. Lord, we just thank you for uh, this morning once again. And uh, just thank you that 2,000 years ago that uh, you, did cho- you did choose Mary. What a humbling experience uh, that must have been, Lord, to just carry you, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And just thank you for doing that. Thank you, Father, that you would send your only begotten Son. Uh, we are so, so much in need. We're so much indebted to you, Lord. And so in saying that, Lord, we thank you for what you've done uh, on the cross, uh, rising again. And Lord, we just want to give you our hearts, um, our whole being unto you, Lord. As we go into 2021, Lord, we just want to live for you. We just want to honor you. We want to give our lives to you and just, you know, take the gift that you gave in your son. We want to take that gift and share it with others. And so I pray if you could help us do that, Lord. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. We got through the first five verses last week. And we don't have much time this morning already. And We are not going to finish chapter 5, like for a couple more weeks. There's just too much richness in every verse and every paragraph. And I don't want to go slow, but I can't just breeze past a lot of this really good teaching that Jesus gives his disciples and you and I. So Jesus, after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness like Bob was talking about during the communion message. He was there for 40 days, just drawing close to the Father, fasting, was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And after that, he started his ministry and he went around, went around preaching the kingdom of God and what that meant and that it was at hand and who could enter into it. Like, how do you get into the kingdom of heaven? And the first thing that he was teaching, which was consistent with John the Baptist, and that is we need to repent. That was the message. Repent, turn from your sins, turn from the ways that you're living, and turn them towards God, 
because he's coming soon. He's coming again, but he's also coming for you. Like we all have a time stamp on God's calendar somewhere up there in heaven. And it's basically, this is when your life is going to end. And so repent, turn, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that Christmas message 2,000 years ago is the same message today. If Jesus was here today, he would say repent. I 100% believe that. I could say that with confidence, that Jesus, if he was here in the flesh again, he would say repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Just like Pastor Charlie said, we live in wild, crazy, uncertain times right now. Well, the message is still the same. So he's, re- he's teaching people to repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he sits down at the Mount of Beatitudes, which is, which is north of the Sea of Galilee. It's this beautiful area. So just in your minds, just picture that you are sitting on this hill with potentially grass all around you, depending on what time of the year. And the backdrop from Jesus' teaching is the Sea of Galilee. So I guess maybe if you just want to envision like a lake behind me. Um, (laughs) I'm not Jesus by any means, not even close. He had hair, I didn't, and he's the son of God. (laughs) Bob had so much hair, it's like messed with his uh, hair. I'm not used to that. But that was the backdrop in this teaching. He sat down with his disciples, he began to teach them, and let's just read up through verse 5 to get a running head start to verse 6. He sat down with them, and he said, "'Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven.'" So Jesus has been teaching, repent, turn from your sins because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will have that kingdom. They will enter into that kingdom. We talked about last week that to be poor in spirit isn't talking about finances. It's talking about spiritual poverty, understanding that you're in need, that you know, the, individual, the individuals that understand that they need God, that they have nothing to offer God. I mean, they recognize that they're a sinner and they are poor. Blessed are those individuals that have come to that realization, their need. They will enter the kingdom of heaven. And many of you in this room have come to that conclusion that you have nothing to offer God. And Jesus would say to you, blessed are you, happy are you. Now, unfortunately, I was in a position before I came to Christ at one point in my life. And there's some people that I know still today that are close to me. They don't recognize the spiritual poverty they're in. They actually have told me, and maybe they've told you too, maybe used to believe this way, that you actually had something to offer God. They didn't view themselves as spiritually poor, but they believe that, no, when I get to heaven, and and if Jesus asked me why I should let you into heaven, I've got something to give to him, and that's my works or the life that I lived. I was a good person. I was a good individual. And you're not so blessed if you have that attitude. If you think that you can actually give something to God, to offer something God, to allow Him into heaven, you're not blessed. You're actually doomed. Because that will not get you into heaven if you think that you are wealthy in the Spirit. I deserve to be here, Jesus. No way. I've been serving the Lord for about 20 years, and I'm a pastor, and I don't even think that's a ticket into heaven. That's not. (laughs) Jesus is the only way. Are you guys watching The Mandalorian? This is the way. Jesus is the way. The last episode was really good, by the way. Did you watch it yet, Brent? Did you watch it? Yeah, it's really good. Sorry to talk about the paganism of Star Wars. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We talked about when those Jesus taught, like when you come to that point of understanding you're spiritually just destitute and that you have a need for God, That does lead to us to mourn, but when we mourn, he's there to comfort us. And we mourn because as we come to know God and who he is, and he just kind of unveils our wickedness and our sin, and it it moves us. And And I read about this in the book of Nehemiah when I'm teaching on Wednesday night. The children of Israel had drifted from the Lord and started committing idolatry, but God gave them mercy and gave them the land again, the land of Israel. And when they understood the forgiveness, when they came to that place of spiritual destitute and they were reading God's word, they began to mourn in Nehemiah chapter 8 and 9. But Ezra, the high priest, comforted them and said, this is a good holy day because you've turned back to God. So blessed are those who do mourn. We should mourn. If you're a Christian, if, we, if I'm a Christian and I'm not moved emotionally over my sinful deeds and wickedness, go between the Lord and ask him why. There are those times that when the Lord just unveils like what he's done in my life, that it moves. It moves me emotionally, and he should. 
And when we are moved emotionally, he's there to comfort us. Verse 5, he talked about to his disciples and those that were listening to him on that hillside, the Beatitudes here. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, strength that is restrained. And Jesus embodied meekness. How could he not? He's the God of the universe. And when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter cuts off that guy's ear. And Jesus says, don't you understand? I'm God. Like, if I wanted to, I could have legions of angels come at my aid right now and deal with this. But Jesus humbly surrendered because that was the Father's plan, was for him to commit himself into the death on the cross and rise again on the third day. That's meekness. That's meekness. That's strength. That's restrained. That Jesus is all-powerful, but he came in a position where he was meek and lowly and gentle because he wanted to fulfill the Father's purposes. And we are to be, we're to take upon that meekness as Christians. We should be meek. I mean, you can be strong physically and even mentally, but we should have this, we should prefer one another. We shouldn't always want to take that position of strength. We should definitely embody a lowly, humbling, loving others attitude. And verse 6 is where we left off last week. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. First of all, when you're reading the Bible chapter by chapter, I mean, a couple chapters, a chapter ago, Jesus was super hungry. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. And after the 40th day, it says that he was extremely hungry. And Satan tempted him about that. Turn that stones into bread. And I told you guys, like, immediately I just think of, like, sourdough bread with some butter and salt on it. I, I, that's, I'll eat that over French fries, I think. But Jesus was super hungry, extremely hungry, going through starvation. And he told Satan that man should not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus, being God being tempted, knew that true satisfaction, that true fulfillment in this life wasn't just by eating food. It was by feeding off of God and God's word. And Jesus tells his, his pupils, I almost said little, but they probably were little. They were probably like five foot two, five three. Um, but he was telling his pupils, he was telling his disciples that blessed are you when you hunger and you thirst after that appetite that God has given you. So many of you might know this, but God created us with certain appetites. One of them is food. One of them is sexual. God created us with the appetite to procreate. And it's not just for procreation. It's for pleasure between a husband and a wife. But that is an appetite. God has created the human body with appetites. One of them is, man is uh, it is not good for man to be alone. Man was created with an appetite to be filled with God. The thing is, is we sinned and separated ourselves from God in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Now, many of us have come to this realization that we realized that in this life, I am not satisfied and, I, and, I, and I'm incomplete and I need something. And we came to that realization that that was God because you were hungering and thirsting after righteousness, which righteousness is God. It's embodied in God. Everything that is right, everything that is truth. Everything that is just, ethically, morally pure, this is God. And blessed are those that have come to that realization that they needed, they hungered and thirsted, that appetite that God created us with, that need for God. Chuck Smith would always say, there's a God-shaped vacuum or a God-shaped hole in our, in our heart that in, and it only can be filled by God. And, and I do agree with that. Now, sometimes we try to fill our needs with motorcycles and trucks and guns and Xbox ones for me. And what else do I like? Food. <laughs> and uh, when I was younger, before I got married, women, women that didn't like me and I was putting all my effort and getting my heart broken all the time, looking to be complete. Um, yeah, it's true. But all those, a lot of those things that can be good, they didn't, they didn't fill me. I was, it still left me unsatisfied. Check this out. Sometimes you can have just a great life. You find your wife. I found my wife. My wife found me. We have kids. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I, I quote unquote, I, 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 I have God in my heart. But you know, it's interesting that when, when loved ones die this time of the year, 
It's joyous, but it hurts because a lot of our loved ones have passed on. Some have gone to be with the Lord, some have gone to hell. And we understand that when we miss our loved ones, there's, there's sometimes a hole there. There's an emptiness. And sometimes it drives us crazy that sometimes during Christmas, people are like so gung-ho and happy and joyful, and we're like, man, I'm hurting. There's a need there. Like, I'm, I'm, I feel incomplete. And God comes there, and he's the comforter, and he completes us. So blessed are those that come to the realization that they need God. They will be filled. Let's not fill our lives with things that incomplete us. The Seattle Seahawks won the Super Bowl, and I was like, my brother still says this to this day, my brother Jeremy. Jeremy, if you're watching, you said this to me. He said, if the Seattle Seahawks win a Super Bowl, I'm good. I don't, I'm complete. I don't need another one. That's not true. He wants more than that. He wants a lot more now. He's always yelling at my, at my football team, his football team. So even if you get one, I know you've told me that too. Like, I just want one. It doesn't satisfy. Only God satisfies. So quick story. I was uh, me, Noah, Graydon, and Charlie. This is probably like eight years ago. Actually, how long have you been married, Delaney? Eight years? Yeah, so it was like eight or nine years ago. We had Thanksgiving at uh, Charlie's house. And we didn't, we didn't know like what Denise and Naomi were doing. Like, it, it felt like we were waiting for Thanksgiving dinner forever. And we're just sitting in Noah's room watching football. And we all get this idea, let's go to Burger King. Let's go, <laughs> let's go to Burger King. We, we're done waiting. Like, we had a need. We wanted to eat. We wanted to be filled. And it was such a bummer because all of us will agree that this is, that was the worst Thanksgiving we have ever experienced. And it was because of us, not because of our wives. Because we went to Burger King. We ate like champs. And we came back, and they had the dinner ready, and we were, not, we were already filled. And we, oh man, we felt guilty, too, because the food looked good. But. So that's just on the physical level there. Um, we are blessed if we satisfy our need, our whole being, with Jesus. Verse 7, Jesus continues on and says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy. Much like grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. And blessed are you who are merciful that show mercy, that live out mercy. You will obtain it yourself. And I actually kind of look at this in the reverse, that us who are poor in spirit, us who have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've experienced that mercy because we were destined for hell, because we had rebelled against him and sinned against him. We were headed towards destruction, but he extended mercy through Jesus. That's one of the gifts that Jesus gave us when he came 2,000 years ago for Christmas. Is It was a gift of eternal life in himself. He extended mercy on the cross if you, would just, if you and I would just believe in him. And when we experience that mercy, how much more should we go out and give people mercy that don't deserve it when they wrong us? That's so hard to do. But if you've been forgiven, Jesus said, forgive others. You know, mercy is not just a biblical idea. It's in the movies everywhere. The Avengers, Transformers, <laughs> Law and Order. You see this in shows everywhere where the villainous character throughout the show is doing just obscene things. And at the very end, more often than not, he has shown mercy or she has shown mercy in that movie or show, and it, and it becomes a great movie or a great show because that villainous character now turns around and goes in it, and just changes or her life and just starts going out and giving mercy and, and just, just a changed life. Now, that doesn't always happen in the movies. Sometimes in the movies, the, the bad guys get uh, judgment, but this isn't just a biblical, it comes from the Bible, but you know, the unsaved world would, would know what mercy is. And we should, as Christians, how much more Jesus says, blessed are you, happy are you when you're living this way, when you're extending mercy to others. I think this is something that all of us could work on in the new year. It's not the new year's message yet, but this, these are the B attitudes, not the bad attitudes, that when we go forth in 2021, try to be a man or a woman that's extending mercy to others that don't deserve it. Jesus did that to you and I. Verse 8, he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I'll be honest with you. When I first read this, and I'm sure that when Jesus first taught this to the disciples and his pupils, they were like, the pure in heart? We're not pure in heart. To, to have that, like the Bible teaches in Jeremiah that the heart is wicked. We're not pure. 
We've missed the mark. We've sinned. But contextually, as Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God, those that are pure at heart are those that were spiritually poor, those that ones that understood the need for Jesus, the ones that have repented of their sins and come close to the Lord through Jesus. Blessed are you when you are at that point where you have a pure heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God. The only way that we can have a pure heart or a clean heart, again, is through Jesus. That's theology, you know, theology 101, that purity comes from Jesus. And if you are pure at heart, if you know God as your personal Savior, you will see God. Fact. Number one, when our sins separated us from God, you were destined on the path that the only time that you would see God is at the great right throne judgment. And that's not, the, that's not really the reunion that you want to meet God at, is the great white throne judgment. You don't get to make a, really a case in front of Jesus at the great white throne judgment if you don't know him as your personal Savior. Jesus clued us in on that day. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. We'll get to that in like two months probably. And we're in Matthew chapter 5 right now. But Jesus said that many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, I went to church. I casted out demons in your name. I did many miracles in your name. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. So there are those that claim that they know God, that they, that they think they're going to see God, but they're not pure at heart. They haven't received him as a personal savior. So they get to see God at the throne judgment but that's the last time they'll see him because then they'll be cast in the lake of fire according to Revelation chapter 21. So blessed are you if you've come to that realization that Jesus is your Savior. You will see God. You will live with him in eternity. You will get to look upon him where the Bible says that no man can look upon God and live. And Moses actually could not, was not allowed in the Old Testament to see God's full glory because it would just consume Moses. But someday when you're in heaven, he's going to transform you into a new body, and you'll be able to see God. You'll be able to live with God. But number two, those who are per, have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that have that pure heart, you're going to have a close, intimate relationship with him. You'll know God intimately. Verse 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. There's two meanings here. The first one, Blessed are the peacemakers. We need more. You guys need to be peacemakers. And I need to be a peacemaker. Number one, this is an evangelistic individual. that, And you're blessed if you have an evangelistic spirit to you, meaning that you want to go out and share Jesus with others. That's another 2021 goal for all of us, is to be a peacemaker, to go out and bring Jesus to a lost, dying world. How, does that, how is that a peacemaker, bringing Jesus to somebody? Well, the Bible teaches you. I'm not, I'm not, this is not my idea or my opinion. The Bible teaches that if you do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're at war with him. You are at enmity, which means you're at war against God. And, and the reason why it says this, it says this in James chapter 4, that those that have not come to faith are at war with God. The reason why you're at war is because if you haven't received Christ as your Savior, you're saying, I don't need your son. I don't need your son, Jesus. I, I, I'm going to take my chances. I, I don't need you. I don't need your son. That's at enmity with God because God's telling you through his word, you need me. I created you. I know that you guys are sinners and I know you need me and that's why I offered myself for you. So if we don't come to that position that we need Jesus, you're at war. You're at war. And so blessed are those that go out and try to make peace with people to receive Christ as their Savior, because Jesus says that once we receive him as our Lord and Savior in the book of John, that you pass from death to life and that you're at peace with God. So blessed are those that go out and do this. And, and you know, we know some individuals that are really gifted at going out and sharing the gospel with others, but we can all do it. We can all do it verbally or the way that we live. He says that those that are peacemakers shall be called the sons of God. I want to get into theology right here. The Bible does not teach that we're all children of God. Catholic Church does, but the Bible does not. We all create, there's a difference between being created by God, we are all created by God, but we are all not sons of God. Galatians chapter 3, I don't know if you want to turn there or swipe there on your, on your phone or your tablet, or if you just want to trust me as I read it, but Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, very plainly, for you are all sons of God through faith 
in Christ Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are a son of God. You're a child of God. You've been adopted into the family that Paul will go on later to say that we cry out, Abba, Father, because we've been adopted in. But if we have rejected Jesus Christ, we are not a child of God. We are not a son of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you he made alive and were dead in trespass and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Paul teaching the church at Ephesus that we're not all sons of God. I mean, we are through faith in Jesus Christ, but before we came to Christ, we were all children of wrath. We were the children of disobedience, he told them. In John, that's why I put these little sticky notes in here. I can't, I can't memorize them all. <laughs> Wish I could. John, Jesus says this in John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the Bible, Jesus himself, makes this clear distinction that the sons of God are those that have received Jesus as their Savior. So that should give us more motivation to go out and share Jesus with others. Blessed are the peacemakers. It, it, it makes all sense. It all connects. We actually do, I believe that teachers and other religious organizations do a lot of damage when they go around telling everybody that, hey, you're a child of God. Like God has completely, has completely accepted you into the family. No, you're just not born into the family of God. You have to repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in Jesus to come into the family. And I know to some people that sounds harsh and it seems that's not good news. It is good news. The bad news is that you, you or I need to repent of our self-righteousness and thinking that we don't need Jesus to be adopted in the family. Jesus is the way. As the man of learning does not say, <laughs> Jesus is the way. Verse 10, when we have, Jesus is teaching this, this all flows together. Blessed are the peacemakers that bring peace. So the, the two, you know, I didn't even talk about the second part of peacemakers. It's obvious. Blessed are the peacemakers. The second point would be, you know, be someone that promotes unity and not division. Get along with others. We need more of that. And, you know, we need more of that in our world today, right? We need more of unity with the politics and the, and the viruses and, and Christians, man. Us Christians, man, we're argu arguing. You know, you guys that are here this morning are either brave or idiotic. Brave or idiotic. That's how some Christians look at you right now. Some, some Christians have talked to me, and they, and they think that Christians should not be attending congregations right now because of the virus. Maybe they're right. So we're either brave or we're idiotic. <laughs> but blessed are the peacemakers, the ones that are trying to find that middle ground to bring unity and to promote God and not trying to rip apart. I, I don't like having a divisive spirit. And it's actually one of the things that God says he hates in Proverbs chapter 6 is a divisive spirit, one who sows discord among the brethren. Blessed are the peacemakers. And this flows into verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are living out these beatitudes, when we experience them and we're, and we're living out meekness and, and sharing the gospel with others, and we're, we're just trying to act in a you know, humble way, just trying to live after the Lord, there are those that do suffer persecution. People don't like it. When I, when I decided in uh, 1999 to give my life to Jesus, I was in high school, I was still a senior in high school. While the Lord used me to bring some of my friends to him, I was also persecuted for some of the things that I didn't want to do anymore. And so I got persecuted. I got made fun of because I wanted to live for the Lord. And it bothers you. It hurts you. You've been the same way when you're just trying to live for the Lord and people persecute for the righteousness but Jesus says, yours is the kingdom. That's just natural. That's what happens. The natural man, apart from God, who lives in darkness, not all of them want to come to the light by their own choice. And so they like to persecute those that are living righteously. 
and I've experienced that. I'm sure you probably have experienced that. And he ties that together with verse 11. Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile or persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for the great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. And these are definitely verses that people don't get tattooed on their body. There are some teachers out there, and, and it's fine, and we do studies and we do conferences sometimes on the promises of God. And there are many great, wonderful promises of God that, we're like, that we just reflect, we reflect on and we're like, oh, those are just so marvelous, and they make you feel good. These, are, these two verses right here about persecution aren't necessarily fun, and Jesus is saying, be glad when you are persecuted for wanting to live for me and then actually just being persecuted because of me, because of Jesus. And, you know, my daughters, you know, they're finding that out in their high school that they go to because they're Jesus followers. They believe in Jesus. They get persecuted. They get made fun of. They get called narrow-minded and, and bigots and stuff, other stuff, other words that we can't say behind the pulpit that I don't like that my kids, you know, get to hear. But blessed are you. It's an honor to be persecuted for Jesus' sake. Now, we don't seek this out, though. I got to make, make that clear. There are some bonehead Christians out there, our fellow brothers and sisters, that are looking for persecution. I'm going to go to this person's house, and I'm going to yell at them, and I'm going to you know, hold up signs, and I'm, I'm going to promote my own persecution. Jesus never taught that we should go promote our own persecution, that I'm going to go out there and see if someone will hit me. <laughs> no, just we will be persecuted for him naturally. Don't go looking for it. Graydon, the youth group leader, was at Bible college, and he was at in and out with some Bible college students, and I think they told a guy, like, Jesus loves you, and they had the window roll down, and the guy reached in and just punched Graydon. <laughs> Graydon was, like, shocked. He was just like, what just happened? I mean, he wasn't looking for it. It just naturally happened. That struck a chord in that guy's soul and was basically responded, I don't care that, Jesus that you're saying Jesus loves me. He just persecuted him. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are arrested for casting out a demon in a girl. And this girl that was demon-possessed, the psychics and the, you know, the witchcraft, they were using her to kind of manipulate the future. And so it was a business. And so they were really upset when Paul cast out the demon. And so they beat him up. They beat him and Silas up, Acts chapter 16. Beat him up with rods and whips. And they went to prison, Acts chapter 16. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, Acts chapter 16. They go into prison, and it says that while they're in prison, they are singing psalms and hymns unto the Lord. They were persecuted. They were beat for Jesus, and yet they could still sing and be glad. I love the story because the guards were listening, and there was an earthquake that day. And the whole place shook, and the, and the, and the, the jail opened up, the, the, the door opened up, and all these other prisoners were escaping. But Paul and Silas, they didn't. They just stayed right there. They did the right thing. They did the, the honorable thing. We're not going to just get out of here. And the Philippian jailer, his whole being, his whole soul shook, and he was about to kill himself. He drew his sword to slay himself, self, and Paul said, don't. And, he, and, the, and the jailer was like, well, what must I do to be saved? I mean, he's hearing Paul and Silas praising Jesus, singing songs after they were beat. He knows that they're spiritual men. He says, well, what do, I do to, what do I need to do to be saved? And he said, Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, Acts 16, 31. And he gave his life to Jesus in that moment. Others are watching us in our persecution. They might persecute us, but they're there. They're watching they're evaluating our lives. Continue to point people. Continue to show mercy to people when they don't deserve it, when they are persecuting you. It's interesting that Jesus had talked about mercy earlier on and then talks about persecution. It's easy to, when someone persecutes you for the faith, it's easy to write them off and, and just equate them to bad guys or villainous people that I, I should just, you know, again, write off. But Jesus didn't do that. Verse 13. We'll close with verses 13 through 16. See, it's going to take us three to four weeks through Matthew chapter 5. Crazy. I mean, we got marriage. We got to talk about marriage and stuff and divorce. You guys going to be here for that? Right. <laughs> I was listening to J. Vernon McGee 
talk about divorce. And he's like, listen, friend, I know you want me to address divorce right now, but I'm just not going to. He's like, I'll do that later on when I get to it. And like Matthew, I forget what it is, Matthew 16 or 18. He's like, I'll, I'm going to address that later. And I was like, well, that's easy for you to, yeah, that's cool. I wonder if I could get away with that. Um, verse 13. You are, Jesus is still there on this hillside, says, you are the salt of the earth. He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to believers in him. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So the, the immediate obvious translation is that we are to be salty Christians, but not in the way that you think. Like not salty, like abrasive and, and just, you know, kind of snarky. And we, ha- we make fun sometimes of people who are salty. They just got a salty personality. Salt, as all of us know, is used as a preservative and also as a food enhancer. And I love salt. If you know me, you know I love salt too much. I love, so, I love salt so much that if you're walking around at church sometimes and you see a little salt shaker where it shouldn't be, yeah, that's me. I, I, I've, left them on, I've left them on the stage. I got like three of them in my office. I, I do a very bad job at, at just not putting things back where they need to be, and, and salt is one of them. I have issues. I, I just It's so much of a food enhancer for me. And salt... Jesus refers to the the flavor aspect, the flavor agent of salt, not the preservation of salt in our life. He's basically telling the disciples that you are the texture, you are the flavor of of living out these beatitudes, of being merciful and being meek and, and, and hungering and thirsting after righteousness. That is the salt that others need in this life. Because naturally, the natural man does not want to be merciful. Doesn't, the natural man, the natural woman does not want to be forgiving, not, doesn't want to be loving. The natural man wants to divide. I mean, just look all over the media today, Twitter, social media platforms. The natural man does not want to bring a cohesiveness to each other. We just want to separate. We want to argue and complain and, and be bitter and start wars. But Christians are supposed to promote godliness and righteousness and holiness, mercy again. That's the salt. Like if you and I are not living out the gospel, not living out the character and the nature of God, then what are we doing? What's the point of my life? What's the point of your life? This is another 2021 message right here in the new year. Lord, I want to be salty. When I, when I, when, when I hang out with other individuals, I want, to, I, want to be able, I want to be living for Jesus in such a way that it enhances others around me. I don't know why, but recently I've gotten a kick where I've been putting salt on my apples. <laughs> Your facial expression is funny. <laughs> now, I first did that because my grandpa used to do it. And I'd always be like, man, what the heck? <laughs> why, why, is he, why is my grandpa ruining a perfectly good green Granny Smith apple? He used to eat Cheez-Its and a green apple on his porch, and he'd put salt on the apple. And I'm like, man, you're, you're messing that up. Well, we have some pink Himalayan salt at my house, the kind that you grind up. And I was like, I'm going to try that. Why not? Plus, when I had coronavirus like over a month ago, I couldn't taste anything. So that's another reason why I'm using salt a lot right now. Because so my taste hasn't all come all the way back. But I'm just sitting there putting the salt on the, the, the apple, and, and it does add texture, which is nice to it, a little crunchy. But <laughs> it, uh, it enhances the sweetness. Like, try it sometime. The salt brings out the flavor of the apple. And we know that salt neutralizes bitter foods too. Salt is good. It brings out flavor. And believe it or not, the world, doesn't, the world thinks that they don't need us, the Christians, that they don't need Christ. Unsaved, unsaved atheist people that hate God and don't want a relationship with God think that they don't need God, but they do. The world needs us. As much as uh, we are being persecuted, right? He talked about being persecuted. Don't give up. This is a message of don't give up. Keep living out the Christian faith and the Christian beatitudes. It brings salt to people. It helps out. Well, I, you know, I work with, in a, in a, I, have a, I work part-time at a fire alarm job, and I, and I still try to be salty around them in a biblical way, in a nice, loving, instructive way, because I know it has value to them. Maybe we don't see it all the time, but you have value to, the, to those that you interact with. You are the salt. Jesus is encouraging you. He's encouraging the disciple that you are salt. 
Don't let it lose its flavor, which means that we potentially could not be all into God and lose that flavor and just kind of go with every mundane thing of this life. And I could go on about this verse, this 1117. Here we just went through a season of politics. And a lot of Christians are kind of discouraged to get into politics, and I would disagree with that. We need Christian saltiness, the truth of God's word, involved in every aspect of our lives, and even civilly. We do. And Christians are pressured now not to talk about abortion. Oh, that's an old issue. Don't talk about abortion. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to recognize that that is a baby in the womb. But that's salt when Christians talk about being pro-life and protecting an innocent child in the womb. In the womb. That's salt. And it brings out the truth. And there are those that are trying to quiet that truth. You know, I don't, I don't need salt. Like, I don't want to hear that. I just want to believe what I want to believe. Now, don't go looking for the persecution, though. Don't look for it. It naturally happens. Jesus is going to go on next week as we uh, get to it. He's going to say, you are the light of the world. So he's going, to com- he's going to combine salt and light that we need to let our light that is Jesus. Jesus is a light. He actually says that in John chapter 8, that he is the light of the world. But we have a light in us, Christ, and we need to share that. We need to let other people see that. We'll go in more depth into that next week. And he says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what it's all about, is glorifying the Father, letting them see the good things that we do, not for salvation, but we do for him because we love him. And I was thinking about that, that I wanted to get to this morning. I was thinking about Judah, my little nephew, and he's not the only one, but my, my nephew Judah just loves serving people. He has this He'll come up to me and be like, Uncle Chris, and he'll hand me a cup of something to drink. And it's like, I wasn't even thirsty. Um, But little Judah tries to recognize needs, and he just wants to give them to people. And I've talked to Graydon before, and it just blesses his heart to see his son doing these things of service to others. That, That makes the father feel good, makes Graydon feel good, because it, it, it shows him that, man, my son is doing something that I want him to do, and that's to serve others. He's not the only one. I could, I could pick out my own children and, and your children, too, that I've interacted with, and you see them do these selfless you know, servitudes unto others, and it blesses you as a dad and a mom, because that's what you want. Your, I mean, any parent that wants, if any parent is only excited when their kids are doing wicked or messed up things, you have issues. <laughs> like, we should want all of our kids to want to serve others and to be nice to others and to be kind. And when you see that, you're blessed. Our Father who is in heaven, He is blessed. He is glorified when we live unto Him, when we allow those beatitudes into our life and then to export them out to others. It's It's a lot of work. And I have not arrived there. I'm not always the most nice guy to be around, unfortunately. I desire to be, though. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> if you need prayer, after, the, after I get done praying, you can come up and we'll pray for you. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for those beatitudes, Lord. We, we all, as Christians, Lord, we desire to live as you want us to live, to, to love others, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to exhibit those beatitudes in our life, Lord. We need you desperately by the power of your Holy Spirit to live out these Beatitudes. It's just not easy, but God, we desire it though. We want to please you, Lord. As we all, a lot of us, in some way in our past, wanted to please our mom and dads, whether getting good grades or just doing good at sports, we wanted to please our parents, Lord. Lord, we desire to please you. Lord, we want to be used by you. God, I pray for all of us, young and old, however old we are in this room right now, male or female, God, we offer ourselves to be used by you. God, we want to be peacemakers. Lord, help us to go out and share you with others. We have a little bit of 2020 still left, God, but we pray that if we have 2021, that you would just all motivate all of us just to want to share you through our words and through our actions. Lord, when we're persecuted, help us not to get down. Help us not to get discouraged. Help us not to give up. Help us not to lose that saltiness, Lord, from your word. But help us to press on rejoicing in you. God, we love you. We thank you for today. Fill us up with your spirit. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. If you need prayer, it's available.